because they say an economist is someone who's good with numbers but didn't have the personality to be an accountant. I believe fervently that we have to study economics uh, in our movement. We need to have economics uh, from a worker's point of view in our movement in order to confront the arguments and the challenges and the attacks that we're going to face. But what is it when we talk about the economy? Is it the GDP statistics that come out from Statistics Canada? Is it the financial reports that we hear and, and see in the newspaper? Is it these pointless market updates that we hear five times a day when we're driving home uh, from work? That is not the economy. That's not what the economy is about and that's not what we need to listen to. What the economy is actually about is something that everyone in this room has in common. And that's the fact that you have to drag your sorry butts out of bed in the morning and go off to a job and do something productive. It's a four-letter word called work. And it's the work that you do and your members do that is absolutely the source of all the value that's produced in our economy. You are the ones and your members are the ones who produce the value. So let's talk about what the crisis is then. If the economy is just the sum total of the work that we do, where did this crisis come from? The GDP is the value that we produce in our jobs. The fact of the matter is, we can do our jobs today just as well as we could do it last year. So what we have to do is take a step beyond the financial mumbo jumbo and talk about what is real and what is valuable in our economy. And that is the work and the production that we as working Canadians undertake every day. And let's demand our right for more work and our right to produce the things that we need in order to have a good, good life, a meaningful and secure life. Where did the crisis come from? It wasn't a natural disaster that explains why we're tightening our belts, a drought or something that wiped out our farms. It isn't a pandemic, although we're obviously worried about pandemics. It isn't a war. Yes, there are wars in the economy, or wars around the world, but it's not wars that wiped out our bridges and our infrastructure and our factories. It isn't some powerful, inexorable, inevitable force from outer space. So let's demystify that and ask at a very fundamental level, why are we in an economic crisis anyway? And here is the answer. It wasn't a comet from outer space. It was these guys. The guys in red suspenders down here on Bay Street, on the stock market, on the other financial institutions who are doing their jobs buying and selling pieces of paper ultimately instead of actually going out and producing something of value. The crisis ultimately arises from this gap, this distinction if you like, between what I call the real economy and the paper economy. The real economy is that part of the economy that produces things that are actually valuable. Here's one small but important part of the real economy. This is a factory that makes beer, okay? This factory makes beer. And in fact, beer isn't just good to drink, it can be a good financial investment as well, okay? I just want to point this out. People are always telling us to invest in the shares of these companies like Nortel Networks and all these other high flyers. Nortel Networks, the shares were worth $125 each in May 2000. Today, the company's in bankruptcy protection and the shares are worth zero. If you had taken $125, bought beer, drank the beer, and took the bottles back, you'd have more money in your pocket today than buying Nortel shares. That's the real economy. Here's the paper economy where they uh, buy and sell ultimately pieces of paper. In theory, the, the real economy is where we do the work to meet human needs. The paper economy is supposed to facilitate the work of the real economy, but it's not directly productive in and of itself. These are people who buy and sell paper assets. For every dollar that's actually raised in useful finance for the real economy from, from the banks and brokerages and hedge funds and everything else, they actually spend $100 just churning financial assets, buying and selling pieces of paper that are already out there. And this pointless process of buying and selling paper assets has a long name. It's hard to pronounce and it's even harder to live with. The name is called financialization. And the crisis that we're experiencing today is a result of this process of financialization that has been taking place since the early 1980s. Ever since the whole sort of corporate agenda came into place, or what we now call neoliberalism, our governments have been emphasizing this pointless paper activity instead of real production. And we've seen the whole stock marketization of our society in things like people being forced to rely on RRSPs instead of pension plans. And while the government and the Bank of Canada kept the real economy on a very, very tight leash, 
Any time unemployment got too low and it looked like people were going to get a raise, they threw a cold bath on the whole economy to create a recession, but they let the financial sector go bananas with no controls whatsoever. This is a graph. This shows the ratio of financial wealth in Canada divided by real wealth in Canada. So the value of all the stocks and bonds and pieces of paper that are out there divided by the value of the actual equipment and buildings and structures that constitute the real capital of our economy. And originally, there was about one dollar in financial wealth for every dollar of real wealth. But since this whole corporate agenda took hold, or neoliberalism, that ratio has grown and grown and grown because the growth of financial activity has far outstripped the real economy that lies underneath it. So today there's two dollars in financial wealth corresponding to every one dollar of real wealth in our economy. And that's what created the seeds of this current crisis. Let me just review the step-by-step -step itinerary of this financial meltdown. It started with this speculative bubble that grew up in the U.S. housing market. There were banks that were engaged in very aggressive and irresponsible practices. Things like ninja mortgages. Have you heard this one? Ninja mortgages. No income, no job. This is how it worked in places like Florida and California. Guy walks into a mortgage office, no income, no job. The bank says, here's a mortgage, go out and buy a home. Okay, that sounds ridiculous, but the bank was counting on the inflation of the housing assets to pay for it. Then you had a situation where speculators, financial speculators, were leveraging their bets on mortgage-related securities like credit default swaps and mortgage bonds and so on, things, again, you can hardly pronounce, using $50 of borrowed money for every $1 of their own money. This was fine while the bubble was exploding, but eventually, starting in 2006, the whole thing came unhinged. Housing prices fell, banks collapsed, and now today we have an actual recession. Well, now what's the government's response to the crisis? Speaking of bailouts, we've had big debates about the auto bailouts and other bailouts, but the biggest bailout of all is what they've done for the financial industry, which is where this problem started, and that's the key point. The U.S. banking system has received trillions of dollars of federal handouts. In Canada, $200 billion. Nobody talks about this, but $200 billion in federal aid for the banking system. That's fine to try and keep banks going, but what about the real economy? If government's going to put dollars into the financial sector, then God damn it, they got to put dollars in keeping our real jobs, our real production, and our real value. Now there's been, if you listen to the market updates, lots of chatter that the recovery is underway, right? That the stock markets are up and the worst is behind us. Uh, but I don't think so. Bank profits are up. Bank profits are improving. Gee, I wonder why. The US government just gave them a trillion dollars. The Canadian government gave them $200 billion. My profits would be up too if they gave me that much money. That's had the whole stock market on fire since March. But the real economy where we work and where we produce is still shrinking. There is no recovery in sight yet and there won't be. And we should not buy the lie that there's a recovery happening just because the financiers are getting a little bit of their money back. That's bullshit to use the technical term in economics. That is, there's no recovery until working people are on the job again. Even if the financial sector turns up again, the real economy is in trouble and we're going to face this process of structural adjustment. And this is why we're here tonight, is to prepare ourselves to fight against that. Their plan is to hit us and hit us hard, to force us to accept things that we wouldn't accept in normal times. They want to blame workers for the crisis, they want to devalue our jobs, they want to rip up our contracts, they want to take stuff from us. We're going to see it in the auto sector already, airlines, the forestry, the resources sector, but believe me, the public sector will be right behind. So what is our to-do list? How do we respond to this? We have to have an explanation. This crisis was not caused by workers. It was caused by the greedy, irresponsible, unproductive Here. speculation of the financial sector. And that's where the blame lies, not with working people. And we have to fight for an alternative economic vision, one that puts our work and our production ahead of finance. This was the massive uh, pension rally we had two weeks ago at Queen's Park. If we have more of those types of struggles and conflict and resistance, then we'll end up stronger than we came into the crisis. We didn't create this crisis, and we're not going to pay for the crisis, and that's why we're here. Let's carry on that fight. Thank you very much for what you're doing.